All right. Hi, Todd. Thanks for joining us today at our July virtual owners meetup. If you missed the first, it's now up on our YouTube channel. So feel free to tune in. Um, this session will be recorded and also shared there for to view at your convenience. Um, but I am Maddie Bordre, the Director of Communications at RV Share and an RV Share spokesperson. Joining me today is Todd from NRBTA. Today we'll hear from Todd on helpful RV repair tips. There's a lot that goes into running an RV rental business, and we hope you find this information we share today in this conversation useful. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Todd. Todd, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what is NRVTA? All right. Well, I'm Todd Henson. I'm the uh, Director of Education and uh, one of the instructors here at the National RV Training Academy. Uh, we're Academy uh, located in uh, Athens, Texas. And what we do is we take uh, RV owners, um, individuals who may want to start a career, becoming a technician or an inspector, and we take them from the beginning all the way through on how to work on their RV, maybe make a living from it as well. And so we're one of the uh, premier schools in the RV space, getting people trained up, of course, either whether to be certified or just simply learn how to work on their RV better. So. I'm um, over the education for that, but I'm also the uh, primary instructor for week one at the National RV Training Academy. Great, well, thanks for joining us today. Um, we'll be having a ton of RV owners tuning in to, to learn more about how to self-repair their RV and maintain it for ongoing trips for different travelers that rent from RV share. Um, so for what an RVTA offers, how is it helpful for possible RV owners that might just want um, to learn how to maintain their RV from trip to trip? And here's the thing. I mean, most of the stuff that goes wrong with the RV, most of it we can fix. We just need to know, you know, where things are, kind of how they work, kind of look at signal flow. And uh, probably about 80% of the stuff that goes wrong with the RV is something that we can repair ourselves. We just need to be taught how and so that's what we do <laughs> you know is be able to show where most of the problems are kind of show a quick fix whatever there may be so um, that's you know what we do here now we take it well beyond that if you're going to be a technician but for um, probably about 30 percent of our students that come to us just want to know how to work on their own rv so that way they can you know just have that much more fun or be that much more successful with their business great so a lot of our owners are having trouble finding like service centers. Obviously there's more RVs out there on the road than ever before. So what is, just give us maybe an overview of what the RV repair industry looks like right now and, and how you guys are, are trying to help help better, better that industry. All right. Well, we know at this point, there's about 11 million households um, in the RV space. And to date, there's probably about 2,500 certified technicians. The RV space, um, if you'll notice that most of the service centers are tied to dealerships. If we looked at it from the auto perspective, there's probably two service centers to every auto dealership and there's hundreds of thousands of dealerships. And so for our cars, easy to take it to a service center and get taken care of. In the RV space, there isn't near the service centers that there really needs to be, or said I say should be, that's simply because we got big RVs, that's a big building. It's just gonna take a long time before there's enough service centers out there if we ever get to that. And so for us, if you own an RV or something like that, you're relegated to waiting months to have your RV, RV repaired. And so what we do is we try and equip and train individuals to go ahead and work on their own RV, or create a mobile um, RV business, right? M mobile RV technician business. And so that's our primary focus is to go after the end user or the eventual mobile tech. Okay, got it. Um, so let's dive into maybe some questions about how RV owners can self-repair um, some, of, some of the issues they might be seeing and that are easy tips. So what are a few things that like, um, you know, a lot of owners see as issues and is there anything that you can suggest for them to kind of have on hand so that they can um, do simple repairs at home? Oh yeah, yeah. So let's just, you know, look at some of the major appliances. And so let's just start off say with the uh, RV refrigerator. 
Uh, now to date, there's really two major types. We have the absorption style refrigerator, which we know just basically runs on propane or runs on electric. Now these refrigerators are different than what we call a residential style refrigerator. The residential style refrigerator in a house, we hardly have to do anything. We just simply keep it clean, okay? But the absorption style refrigerator, a little bit different. There's some nuances to it that it's kind of confounding. You know, your residential style refrigerator, of course, it will actually auto defrost. And <laughs> those of us that have uh, this absorption style refrigerator, it doesn't defrost. And one of the things we have to deal with is that frost in the back of the freezer. Now, the reason why the frost builds up is because there's been air in there. And so a lot of it has to do with us opening the doors and keeping it open, right? Warm, moist air goes in there, and that's what forms on the back. On the residential style refrigerator, it from time to time goes to defrost and takes care of that. The problem that we have is with these residential, I'm sorry, with the uh, absorption style refrigerators, they don't defrost much. And the question is, is what do we do? Now, just the standard way, you know, especially say if it's a rental or something like that, is whenever the rental uh, time is over, time frame is over, unplug it, open the door. You know, <laughs> the problem is that takes a couple hours to do that. One thing that we can do to kind of help out is to put something on the back of the freezer wall. So that way when the ice does form, it doesn't form to the wall. Now, typically a lot of people will get like the really thin cutting boards and put those back there. I wanna, I wanna suggest something just a little bit better. The, the problem with the cutting board that we have back there is it's, it's kind of thick. I know it seems really thin, but it's kind of thick. And that kind of adjusts the performance of our freezer, mm -hmm. right? And if you'll notice the absorption style refrigerator, doesn't get really cold. We get about 10 degrees. And so ice cream is an issue, right? Now, I think if you're putting the ice cream up in the freezer, you're doing it wrong in the first place. You're a quitter. <laughs> right, just finish it off. No. <laughs> but we want to put something thinner back there. And one thing that works really well is get cellophane, you know, uh, saran wrap. Mm -hmm. And if you put saran wrap back on there, the cling will make it stick to the wall. So that way, when the ice forms, it forms to the saran wrap. And it's a lot easier for us to pull the ice off to self defrost it. So that's one thing that we could do for the freezer. Now, I would also suggest, and, and maybe a word to um, the, the people who will be uh, renting, and that is these freezers do not perform as well as the residential style refrigerator. So we never really want to stick warm food in the freezer. That raises the temperature and it takes it a lot longer for it to get back to freezing. So we wanna do everything we can to cool the food off, whatever it may be, or put it in cold, right? Mm -hmm. If we move down to the um, refrigerator section, you'll notice there's no fans in there. One thing that we can do to make that refrigerator perform a little bit better is put a little 12 volt fan just to move some air. When we move air, we actually change the temperature. Heat runs to cold, so it runs across the coils. But there's something odd about the residential style refrigerator. And that is, of course, the back of the refrigerator, there's this little drip pan. That drip pan grabs the condensation. Now, up top, it turns to the frost, you know, so it's the ice. In the refrigerator, we're pulling the moisture out of the air. So we've had this little condensate pan. Well, that leads through a little tube. And this is totally different than our residential style refrigerator. But on the outside of our RV are these little drip tubes. Now these drip tubes, in order to function properly, they should have little caps on them. Now this cap right here is gonna be for a uh, Norcold style refrigerator. I'm sorry, Dometic, my apologies. This is a Dometic style refrigerator. <laughs> if you have a Norcold, this is what it looks like. And a lot of people don't know what these are, right? They have the tube out there and they either they yeah. lose these or they take these out. And these are there for and designed for a reason. What they're doing is they're holding that water in that drip tube. And the reason why we're holding that water in the drip tube is if I have water sitting in this drip tube right here, then I don't have warm, moist air coming into the tube. If I have warm, moist air going into the tube, then all of my uh, food becomes soggy and wet. And, you know, my um, uh, evaporator fins in the back stay wet. What we want to do is everything we can, if we think about the refrigerator, we want to keep it closed and we want to keep it sealed. So that way, as, as the cooling cycle takes place, it's pulling out the moisture and then eventually there's no moisture. And if there's no moisture, then the food can cool down quicker and get to the temperature we want. When these come out, then we're constantly allowing warm air to go in there and the refrigerator can't keep up, right? So we wanna make sure that yeah. we have those. 
we want to make sure that we have air circulating in there. And I know that these resident on these um, absorption style refrigerators are not very deep, right? And the one thing that we really need to do is make it even worse. We can't push the food all the way back to the wall. If we push the food back to the wall, then I have no circulation. Unfortunately, we need to make sure that there's a, a sufficient <laughs> space back there for that air to flow back and forth. Um, if we get into a situation where we're having to store with the, you know, the RV, but one thing we want to do is if we cannot keep power going to the refrigerator, then we want to open the doors. I don't care how good you clean these things. If they stay closed and it goes through a summer, it's going to smell bad, okay? Sure. Because there's still stuff in there. So the best thing that we can do, open it up, maybe put some a wedge in there or something like that, keep it up and let it breathe. You'll be, you'll be surprised at how much better we can take care <laughs> of that smell. Yeah. Now, some new RVs, now we have the new 12 volt compressor refrigerators and I'm excited about those because <laughs> I'm not big on using propane going on down the road, but we are seeing a lot of reports. Now what it is, is just a small compressor that runs off the battery and it's amazing, but it's, it's gen one and gen two. And we all know that anytime we have something brand new, we still have to work the kinks out. If you have this, this is what we need to know. It runs off the batteries. And if we're plugged into short power, then we have help for our batteries. It's called the converter, right? And the converter is always helping out. The thought is if we have a 12 volt compressor style refrigerator, the refrigerator can run going down the road. The problem is, is the state of charge of that battery. Now, a lot of our RVs, we have just standard lead acid batteries right there's nothing that tells us the state of charge of that battery you know we're kind of dumb when it comes to those batteries so as we're traveling down the road the charge goes down well this this little compressor is still trying to work right and it's having to work harder because the voltage drops what we're seeing right now is uh, on certain brands we've got about a 40 percent return because the compressors are going out and the biggest culprit is because we have low voltage what I want to point out is, is, you know, if you do have that 12 volt compressor style refrigerator, do all that you can to maintain that battery, right? Make sure if it's a lead acid battery that you're putting in distilled water every single time before it goes out, make sure it's at a full state of charge. And then you may want to tell um, the uh, customer, hey, we can probably get about three or four hours before this needs to be plugged in. Now, the reason why I say three or four hours, you could probably get a little bit more, but if you sure. tell someone four, they may take six, right? Yeah. But tell them, hey, get three or four hours, and then you, you definitely need to plug it in because the battery is going to start really going down. You get about between 300 and 600 watts being pulled through there, but it's not going to yeah. run it 100% of the time, right? So those are some, some quick and easy things we want to, you know, like I said, keep, you know, keep the frost from staying in there. We want to make sure that we have an airtight seal, and then if you have the compressor style refrigerator, now the compressor style refrigerator doesn't have that drip tube, um, but does need good proper voltage, 12.7 volts. So have a good strong battery and that should help maintain it. Now, if you have lithium batteries, not near the problem, totally different chemistry and they work a lot better. And I think that's where we'll go with this, right? The more 12 volt stuff we have, probably look at lithium batteries. Um, next thing is awnings. I'm sure it's an issue. <laughs> oh yeah. That's one of the top issues with RV owners and renters. Wow. Um, so yeah, let's hear about awnings. Any tips you have there? Yeah. Now awnings, I can tell you, we work with FEMA on this as well, typically. And I don't know if the clientele is the same, but you got a lot of people that if they're to me, if they're renting, mm -hmm. they, they haven't owned, so they don't know better yet. They're, they're kind of new, you know, to the RV lifestyle. Now these awnings, I want you to think of them. They're just huge kites. They are a kite. That's all they are, right? We don't get warnings of wind gusts or anything else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the way these awnings are made, right? Of course, we have them setting up. And if they're setting level, then of course, they're just waiting for a nice gust of wind to take it off. Yeah. RV renter or something like that has no clue. They want the shade. They think, you know, if it's raining or anything else, how awesome to have these out. We kind of have the same thing with, um, of course, survivors with FEMA. And we really, I mean, honestly, it's, it's hard to 
work with the customer on this. Now, some of them, if they've been doing this a while, but simply tell them, look, you know, if there's any gust of wind, bring those in, right? It has to be a still day. Um, and quite honestly, we don't want them out when it's raining because when you pull those back in, they're wet. And when you roll that back in, you're going to get mold, right? Yeah. So we want yeah. those out drying. If you do have mold, uh, hydrogen peroxide mixed with water is a good way to get those, you know, that mold right. taken off. But let's say <laughs> uh, that we uh, messed up the awning. The problem that we have is there's so many different types of awnings, and I, you know, I, I get a lot of questions on this. Brand-wise, Solara or Solaris, which is um, a uh, Dometic product, they're pretty easy for us to fix. I mean, as, a, as an individual, we can get up there and we can fix it. Here's my concern. Let's say, you know, for whatever reason, one of the arms is broken or something like that. Mm -hmm. I hate going over and how to fix, you know, going over with someone who doesn't quite know the awning itself, simply because most of the awnings are spring loaded. And guys, it's a huge spring. I want you to think of the old school garage doors, right? And they have that huge spring and that spring is wound up and it's under tension. It's typically on one side. We have a motor on one side of our uh, awning and on the other side, we have a spring that helps keep it, you know, uh, uh, synchronized. Well, if we have to take off the old awning arm, just know that that one that's on the opposite side of the motor is under tension. And guys, a standard wrench may not be strong enough to hold it. You have to get a nice size wrench because you're having to hold that down. I've seen people break yeah. their fingers and everything else because, of course, the wrench slips and comes right back around and snaps. Sure. So <laughs> here's what Ouch. we suggested <laughs> yeah, with FEMA. And that was to simply disconnect them, okay? okay. Um, disconnect those. Now, I don't know, uh, you know, clientele-wise, whether they're like, well, you know, if, if for me, you know, there, there a couple of things to disconnect them. And the easiest way to do that is to get over to, um, let's say you agree to go ahead and disconnect those because quite honestly, <laughs> it's going to save you a lot of money. But if you disconnect them, there's a simple way of doing that. Yes, of course, you can go up to the motor, but you have to get in your ladder and everything else, and you have to pull off the cap and just disconnect one of the wires, which you can do. Mm -hmm. Or you can go inside where your button is, right? You got your extend, you got your retract. If you pull that out, you can simply disconnect from, of course, your switch. Easier for you to come back and put it back in because that's behind the wall. So give you, a, you know, an easy way to disconnect that. And the thing is, of course, as you're, you know, communicating with them, you say, well, we have this, we have high winds, so we have disconnected it. You know, we have high winds sure. coming up. Some of that is just maybe um, uh, notifying the, the customer or whatnot. But let's say you can't do that, right? Let's say they're just going to ask for that. So then you want to really go over steps. Hey, look, if there's any gust of wind, I, you, you need to bring it in. Not only that, but if they're set level, find the way to set them for the range. I mean, for the rain. Mm -hmm. Bring the points down right? Harder for wind to, to come up underneath there. So it can stand a little bit more. But I yeah. tell you, I mean, the way to, if they're in an RV park, I said, if you're the only one with your awning out, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> like, <I would> look <laughs> yeah. at an educated RV owner, they know they may have them in. So, all right, if they have men, I should yeah. have mine. Yeah. Never, and I always Great. tell them, never leave the RV, never leave the RV with the awnings open. No one's there to pull it back in. Even right. if it's a hot day, it's a still day or anything else, you never know what's coming in. Just make sure, have a note on the door, whatever there may be, bring that awning in before you leave. You can bring it back yes. out when you show back up. <laughs> Please don't, don't leave the awning open um, whenever you um, leave. What I want to do is go over how to prevent, you know, some, some ways to prevent the damage. When the damage has occurred, a little difficult, right? Now, I'm not saying it can't be fixed. Just be aware of that spring. Uh, Insects, I'm sure, is uh, one that uh, people have <laughs> questions about. Now, here's yeah, a, sure. I am a big believer. Now, with insects, a couple things, right? Now, typically as RVs, we're out in the woods. We're in their territory. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of our RVers, we complain about insects, we complain about rodents and everything else, but we want to enjoy nature, and part of nature is these insects, <laughs> So uh, it's, not, it's not the RV park. It's not where we're at. It's just, that's just the fact of life. Um, for bugs, 
you know, we're, we don't want them getting into the entries and primarily the bugs like the smell of propane. So oh, interesting. kind of a catch 22, right? Now here's the thing. I am a big believer in using what we call dauber screens. Now this is a large wire mesh uh, device that goes over both the uh, exhaust and maybe the entry of all of our propane devices, our, our furnace, our uh, refrigerators, our water heaters, right? We wanna prevent the larger bugs from getting through. And typically those bugs find their way in during the summer. They build their nest inside the exhaust pipe or whatever there may be. We're none the wiser until winter mm -hmm. when we begin to use it. I'm a big believer in these um, uh, dauber screens, but I need to warn you, all the manufacturers if your RV is still under warranty, they will void the warranty if they see the dauber screen on there. Now, okay, good to know. I would, you know, I get it from Suburban, the medic, they all tell us, well, no, that slows down the air. I think it's trash, but that's the warranty. So what I would recommend, um, if you're not out of warranty, definitely put those on. If you're in warranty, don't have them on when you take it in for service. <laughs> you may want to use that, but don't have it on when you take it in for service. Another way, um, we know that insects, and they, I mean, yeah, typically paper wasp, uh, dirt daubers, mud daubers, depending on where you're from, what you call those, they love getting in there, and even mice, right? I mean, literally, mm -hmm. we have pulled, and I hate to say this, we have pulled squirrels out of a furnace, <laughs> right? They just, I don't know okay. why, they just go in there looking, right? So if yeah. I can find a way to prevent them from coming in all the way down to say a dirt dauber, then great. But another thing that we can do, uh, we typically don't use the furnace until winter. So late, late summer, you know, maybe getting into the fall, what I would recommend is begin to start cleaning out your furnace, okay, to try and get anything out. Now, the thing is, it's all loop to loop or whatnot, but you know, you can get a vacuum put the vacuum up in there and begin to try and suck out what you can. Now, a telltale sign you know, of an insect or you know, there being an obstruction inside one of your furnace, uh, furnace, water heater, whatever, is the soot that shows up on the outside. You ever see soot show up whenever you're trying to run the furnace or whatever there may be? That's mm -hmm. because there's something on the inside. A properly designed uh, propane fired system will not create soot. So if you have soot, that means there's an obstruction. Definitely, that's a telltale sign. You need to go in there and get it cleaned out. But if you can service it before you need it, then that gives you time to fix it. You know, Because the worst times that the furnace doesn't work or that we find there's insects is when it's cold. There's no insects, but the remnants are there. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the paper wasp nest or the, the dirt dauber nest or even just the carcasses. Yeah. So Yeah. Would there be a smell too, possibly? Um, so, well, if it's a rodent, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, that wouldn't smell good. But sometimes right. I do not, feel like furnaces. Not necessarily with, not necessarily a... with yeah, the, yeah. Now, there would be a smell if you're burning it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but now, typically, you don't know because, of course, it's the summer. You're not even looking at your furnace. But if you're ever yep. sitting around your RV, you can watch them fly in there. Like, where are they going? You know, when they're creating their nest. Mm -hmm. um, on the ground, ants. Ants is a problem. Um, if your RV is under a tree and there's just even a tree limb touching anything, ants will come down. I mean, it's just yeah. Murphy's law, right? All other RV yeah. sites will have no problems with ants. It's only on yours, right? So um, typically what we want to do is make sure that on the sides, nothing, no, no ants. Ants will come up your water hose. If your water hose is hooked up, come up your power line or whichever. Now, depending on the product you want to use, that's what you want to address. So your water hose, anything else, wherever it is on the ground, that's where you want to address it. If you're into you know, poison, whatever there may be, you got to find a way to mm -hmm. prevent those ants from coming there. They will find their way uh, in there. If, if you don't put down poison or whatever, you got to find some preventative measure, but think of contacts. And literally we have been up at 10 o'clock at night, you know, trying to figure out how they're coming in through the roof. And it's just a simple limb, you know, touching the ground. <laughs> they will make it. Um, rodents, I have not found a foolproof way to stop them. Now, lights do help. So the under, you know, under the frame lights do help out. 
I've seen people put soap and then I've seen people take pictures of the soap being chewed up by rodents. <laughs> uh, you know, um, there's no foolproof road with that. Rats have been here longer than us. And I think they're going to stay. Yeah. All I can say is that's going to be part of the RVing experience. If I could find a way, you know, short of, you know, bringing a cat, you know, <laughs> yeah. take care of that. let's transition to um, like cosmetic damages. I think when a lot of our RV owners are turning um, their RV rentals over quickly and bringing in new yeah. renters, you know, a day or two later, and there could be a scratch down the side or a small dent that, you know, they might want to make the new renters aware of, or they might not have time to fix it. Do you have any tips on, you know, what they maybe could do for, for smaller cosmetic damages on the body of the RV? Well, if it's, if it's cosmetic or if it's a scratch or something like that, if, a, if the side is a, say fiberglass or something like that, and that's just find a buffing agent, you know, to go ahead and take care of that. But I would definitely, you know, just like you would, if you have a car rental or, Hey, look, I see this here. I think more, and I don't know as the owner that, you know, <laughs> where everything is. Um, right. So on a quick, you know, something like that is just to buff it out. Now, when it comes to, you know, popping out a dent, they do have the suction cups. They do work in heat, right? If it's really hot outside, mm -hmm. yes, you can, you can get a little suction cup, something and pull out the dent. It's not, may not be perfect, but it does look a heck of a lot better. It's less effective when it's cold outside, right? So, you know, you, you're not really getting the flex, but you know, those are really the two quick things that I would know you know, how to do, mm -hmm. uh, whenever like, just coming in real quick. Okay. Let's, let's get a buffing agent. Let's get this out. Let's make it look, you know, kind of whole, it's mm -hmm. still there, but at least we hide it behind the wax, um, uh, or, you know, pull out the dam. Okay. What about, um, AC units, especially this summer in the hot heat, what, yeah. you know, AC units are essential to RV camping and one of the perks of renting an RV. Um, do you have any tips for us on, on that? Yeah. Airflow is king. Okay, airflow is king. Okay, and that means um, you probably want to uh, clean out or change your filters uh, more often than if it was your own. Okay, now I'm not a big proponent of cleaning the filters because, of course, I think it's easier and just as cheap to replace them. Matter of fact, I get this stuff from Walmart, and it's it's there 12 years or 12 I'm sorry 12 months out of the year. It's over there where they pick up uh, air filters, right? Now this is the same type material that we use in the air conditioning, but when you open this up, it's actually three foot wide and two foot, um, about two foot long or whichever, right? Whichever, three foot long, two foot wide. If you take your old filter, the problem with the filters is they're kind of flimsy, right? And when you wash mm -hmm. them, they begin to stretch out. Now you've got unsighted yeah. filters and everything else. They're really not doing their job. But if you take that filter and lay it down on this, you got yourself a template and you can cut it. Now here's the thing. This is less than a dollar. It's 96 cents and you can have three or four filters. I'd recommend in between replacing each one. Yeah, each time just replace them. I mean, it's a dollar, you know, for you to do that. You can do up to three ACs easily and still have some left over. Simply replace them. If I can get you in a habit of doing that quite a bit, and if you're mm -hmm. replacing that quite a bit, then your uh, coils will, it'll take longer for them to get dirty. Okay. And that's where we have problems when those coils, the evaporator coils get dirty. We don't get, you know, uh, good airflow. And of course we don't get cold air conditioning. And if we don't get that, that means the compressor is working harder. So airflow is king. And if we can keep those cleaned and keep the coils clean, you know, keep from the coils getting everything, then great. Now, I also don't recommend, I know this is kind of flimsy and that's perfect. Please do not double up the filter um, or use a, a HEPA style filter because the air conditioner is not designed to purify air. It's just designed to pull air and make it cooler. And if we restrict the flow of air, then we're making that air conditioner work harder. And I think that would, you know, one, it's going to shorten the life of your air conditioner, but two, it's not going to give you the temperatures you want. If we keep the filters clean, that's what they're for. That's to clean the air. Okay. Mm -hmm. Keep the filters clean. You don't need the, the thick stuff, but just keep those clean. It should run a lot better. If we could get some shade on the shrouds, great. Now, from time to time, uh, uh, twice a year, you need to get up there and clean the coils. Okay. And you mm -hmm. get yourself some coil cleaner, take some time, get up there, just spray that on, let it do its job. If it's on the evaporator coils, you don't even need to rinse it. 
because of course, when you turn on the air conditioner, it produces its own water, right? It, it takes the moisture out of the air. So you don't even need to clean or rinse the coils. You just need to spray, spray them clean. That's what's gonna make that air conditioner perform a lot better. Yeah, I've had one before that freezes up when on a rental. So I think too, there could be a tip in there about preparing your renters to how to properly manage their air conditioner. Um, and so, you know, turning it off when it's not being used and making sure properly setting the temperature. Um, I, I think that's important to remind renters as well. Well, here's the thing. If that coil freezes up and the air conditioner is not performing properly, there's a, there's a little yeah. thermostat. It's called a a freeze stat or a thermistor. It sits actually inside the coils, right? And what it does, it sends a signal over to the compressor, says, hey, it's too cold, turn off. So the air mm -hmm. conditioner automatically cycles. If you are getting um, frozen uh, coils, two things. One is if you were to take out your filter and look up, if, if, if it's a standard air conditioner, you're gonna see yep. this little white cable hanging down, right? That means it's out of place. We just need to put that back in. It's really simple. We just take that, it's a little uh, uh, piece of wire on the end, just a little stick of metal. We take that, we can slide that back into the coils. Now it's gonna cycle for us, right? If the air conditioner is working properly, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what temperature you set it on, it's gonna do its proper cycle. It's a little bit different, um, but if that's out, then yes, you would, you would have to manually turn off the air conditioner when not using it. Let that defrost everything else because you're not going to get any cold air when that's frozen. I know it sounds weird, but you're not going to get any cold air. Uh, but if that is the case, rather than take it into, you know, uh, someone like me to charge you so much just to go boop, look up there, yeah. you'll see that little kind of look for it. It's called a thermistor. You don't even need to know the name. You need to find it, stick it back in. Right. Yeah. And you can do that from the bottom. Good tip. Great. Um, is there anything else, any other tips that we wanted to cover off on that could be a great piece of knowledge for an RV owner to know? Um, generators, you want to do something on generators real quick? Okay, so if you have an onboard generator or even a portable generator, there's a couple of things. I mean, yeah, you have to kind of let the uh, customer know the generator is not going to be as powerful as shore power. I was, they're always smaller. Mm -hmm. But generators, um, because they're small engines, they burn a lot of oil. We are not in the habit of checking the level of oil because we have really good cars now that we don't check the oil. We just go in and change it. But with generators, they're smaller engines. They drink oil. Well, they put a little device in there, a little float valve. that's basically it's a low-pressure oil switch. And what it'll do is it'll shut the motor down if there's not enough oil. Problem is it doesn't do it in the very beginning. This is what it will happen. If a customer calls you and says the generator is running and then it stops. I start it up again, it runs for a couple seconds, let's say 10 or 15 seconds, and then it stops. That's a telltale sign that you don't have enough oil. It's not that you don't have enough fuel because if it starts back up, you have fuel. But if it dies, you can start it back up and it dies again, start it back up and it runs again about say 10 or 15 seconds, then it dies then you have low fuel or low oil. Make sure that you always have enough oil. If it's an own-in, 30-weight oil is what you use, right? Just have that little um, one quart there. Usually it takes one to two quarts to fill it up, not much to it. Um, a tip on the generator, make sure the air conditioner or any heavy load is not on when you start the generator. Generator is mechanical and it has to spin the rotor and it takes... 10 or 15 seconds for it to get going. We always want the generator to run, you know, a good 15, 20 seconds before we put any heavy loads. So just remind, you know, the individual, hey, if you have the generator here, make sure you turn off, you know, the air conditioners. The lights are okay because that's 12 volts, no big deal. But let the generator run for a little bit before we put it under load. And that's going to help extend the life of that generator and not flip the breakers. Great. Well, thank you so much, Todd. You are a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure you could talk about this stuff for hours and hours. We'll have to have you back to cover off on a few more things that I'm sure RV owners would be super interested in hearing. So um, thank you so much for your time. And we will link more information about NRBTA and where you can find Todd and his team if you're interested in hearing more. Oh, do I get this? 